Hi guys, welcome back to Reserved Investments. So one of my addictions in life is pretty much absorbing content that revolves around economics, finance, alternate asset investing, and traditional investing. I'm a huge fan of CNBC. I'm a huge fan of a lot of lesser known and popular finance channels on YouTube that cater to alternate asset investing, traditional investing, real estate investing, the whole nine yards. Well, one channel that I am really subscribed to and I'm really tuned into is called Economics Explained. Now, before we go any further, I'm not sponsored by any corporation. I don't even know who runs the YouTube channel, Economics Explained. Um, I will state it seems to be a really highly polished YouTube channel. So that being said, I'm sure that it's run by some broadcasting company linked to one of the major conglomerates. If not, the person that does run this channel is doing an excellent job because they really know YouTube editing. They know how to make excellent content that blows anything that I produce out of the water. Well, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because a lot of you guys liked some of the videos that I did on the high-end art market. And it really opened some of my viewers' eyes to what's happening with people who can afford to pay $10 million, $100 million, $250 million per painting and why that market exists and how it serves to diversify assets in that type of portfolio if you're somebody who has a net worth of a billion dollars, two billion dollars or more. Well, Economics Explained put out an excellent video on this on May 31st, 2020, and the video is entitled The Economics of the Art Market, Why This Painting Isn't Worth $450 Million. Well, back in 2017, a very quote-unquote rare, one-of-a-kind Leonardo da Vinci painting sold for $450 million through, I think it was Sotheby's in New York, if I remember correctly. And this video takes a look at the ultra-high-end art market and breaks down why people invest in that market, meaning what the returns are, why anybody who has a net worth of billions of dollars would be willing to spend $450 million on one painting. One of the things that this video does great is it delves into the topic of opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is a lesson that I have preached since the beginning of this channel. It's also a topic that a lot of the speculative fanboys from the Pokemon space, the Magic Gathering space, the great video game space, all get upset when I bring up because the simple definition of an opportunity cost is the loss of a potential gain from other alternatives when one alternative is chosen over another. So what I mean by that is, you'll see a lot of people coming into the comment section stating, hey Sean, I bought this limited run game for $60 and I can sell it today for 80 or 100 or 120. And my response is, that's great, but let's be fair here. When Limited Run offered that through their website, they had a minimum or maximum purchase amount of two, meaning the max you could buy when that game came out was two. So if you're telling me that you spent $60 for an item and you bought two of them, let's assume that you bought the max, and today, several years later, you can only sell that item for $80 to $100. Yes, if we break down the percentages, your returns are probably double digits. Don't get me wrong, that's great. But what you have to compare that to is the opportunity cost. What else could you have done with that money that maybe resolved it in less work where you don't have to take possession of an item, you don't have to inventory it, you don't have to store it, you don't have to list it on eBay, you don't have to reship it back out, you don't have to hope that the person who's buying it doesn't file a claim against you through eBay or PayPal or even if that doesn't happen, you also have to hope that the item doesn't get damaged in the mail to the buyer. Now, that being said, opportunity cost is one of the most important things you can learn as an investor. I truly believe that. You really have to understand what goes into some of these markets. For instance, I've said this before, any of these markets that are under the guise of a speculative bubble right now, they're not for me. That doesn't mean in the future, I'm not going to put money into Pokemon cards or Magic the Gathering cards or even quite possibly, I'm going to say it, I really don't have an appeal for this side of the market at present time, great at video games. There may come a time where I look at the market and notice that it's starting to settle, meaning prices are starting to stabilize. I may decide, you know what, 
I do want certain vintage video games that I've had in my youth graded in factory sealed condition. I'm going to go after them, I'm going to buy them and hold them for a little bit. It's just like people ask me all the time, am I done with comic book collecting? The answer is no, but comic book collecting for me, because I'm a high-end collector, has been placed on hold because I consider that market to be too high, highly manipulative at present time. Let me use those words. I think it's very speculative. I think too many key comic books have shot up in value over the last five years exponentially to the point where their prices cannot sustain on the secondary market for 5, 10, 15, 20 years out. That's why I like traditional antiques. I like coins. I like currency. And it's interesting because right now, the way where the economy is right now, given the pandemic that we're going through, given the unfortunate situation with the rioting that's going on across certain U.S. cities in America at present time, I'm noticing that a lot of people are starting to go after rare coins to the point where every auction that I'm involved in with rare coins, I really have to fight off not only hardcore investors, but I'm also fighting off speculators who are coming into the market in droves. Now, I only have roughly 1,900 subscribers on this channel, so I can't imagine that my channel is causing an influx of people to want to spend two, three, four thousand dollars on a rare coin all of a sudden. So when I look at that market, I have to look at it like it is valid. It's not really speculative because most people don't last long if they get into a market like traditional antiques, coins, currency, if they have a speculative mindset because those markets are very mature and or established. They're very sophisticated in the trade. So what I want to do in this video though, and I'm getting off on a little bit of a rant here, I'm going to post a link to this video titled The Economics of the Art Market, Why This Painting Isn't Worth $450 Million in the description below. And I would encourage all of you to at least take the time, I think it's like 17 minutes long, just to watch this video with an open mind. That's all that I want you to do. This is a great lesson, whether you're cognizant of this market or you have no idea that multi-billionaires out there are willing to pay close to half a billion dollars for one painting. So I think that this will really open your eyes and it'll also help you understand not only opportunity cost, but really what happens in the high-end antiquities, antique, and art markets. Because one thing, guys, I'm going to tell you something, and this is something that I've been trying to preach on this channel for a long time now. Don't get me wrong, just like all of you out there, I love pop culture-based collectibles. Okay, really, I do. I like Magic the Gathering. I like Pokemon. You know, I grew up with Atari, Nintendo, TurboGrafx-16, Neo Geo, own them all. I, my, really, my heart is connected to those items. But once you start learning the truly historic side of the antiques, the antiquities, the high-end art market, you start to get into coins, you start to get into currency, it's very hard to go back to looking at collectibles the same way as you did before. And this is something that I really try to teach on this channel because me, I had a different experience growing up. I really loved a lot of pop culture collectibles, but I also learned the high-end antique side of the trade starting at the bottom from the age of 12 on up. So when I hold a coin from 1899 and I hold a video game that was released in 1991, I kind of get a different feeling than most people out there where I'm kind of leaning towards the historic nature of the coin for long-term investment for that reason. So some people accuse me of having a bias. I really don't have a, a bias. What happens is I've been enlightened. That's the way I look at it. And I know some of you out there aren't going to like me for saying that. I know I may even lose subscribers with that comment. Believe me, I am prepared for that. But at the same token, I really think once some of you guys start learning some of these other markets, whether it's traditional antiques, whether it's vintage advertising, whether it's coins, currency, collectible first edition books, artwork, antiquities, art glass, art pottery, antique furniture, bottles, whatever your passion is, even firearms, edged weapons, and you're able to hold an item that was made or manufactured or produced 100 years ago, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, or dare I say 500 years ago or more, you're really going to find a way to connect with those items that you really can't do with pop culture collectibles. 
And that's really what I try to teach on this channel. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with loving comic books. There's nothing wrong with loving vintage toys. I love all that stuff. But if somebody puts a G.I. Joe figure from 1983 in front of me, and somebody else puts a coin from 1847 in front of me, and I'm holding the coin, I have a special connection with the coin more than I do with the G.I. Joe figure. And I think that's very interesting when you look at your journey as to what you're going to embark on if you choose to go full in on the antiques and collectibles trade. Most people start off in the collectible side of the trade because the barrier to entry is very low. They then work their way over to the antique side. And usually that's when the aha moment comes. When you start getting involved in a lot of these markets that are extremely established, that are mature. When you go and you interact with people who just understand the historic nature of this stuff and they just get it. They understand that every day somebody's in school learning about George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or the Revolutionary War or even the Crusades. And you understand that you can own a piece of history from that particular time period. That's when it kind of clicks and you go, oh, well, gee, opposed to a comic book that was produced in 1938, 1939, yeah, I really think this item from 1884 or 1899 or 1778 is more historic than that particular item. So that's all that I'm leaving you with. Again, I'm not bashing collectibles. I'm not saying antiques are better. But what I am going to tell you guys is once you start learning both sides of the equation, you're going to see that there's a reason why a lot of money is shifting to the other side of the equation and always was there. For instance, a lot of people try to compare comic books to high-end art or video games to high-end art. I'm sorry, the chances of a comic book or a video game ever selling for $10 million or more is very slim. There were people, when I did the, 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 the videos on the Nintendo PlayStation prototype system, there were people that came in and told me that system was going to sell for a million dollars or more, and I don't know what I'm talking about. And ironically, I didn't delete those comments. The people came back and deleted those comments when the system flopped on the secondary market through the auction site that it was sold in. That's how bad it was. People were coming to my channel, deleting those comments after they were laughing at me, telling me that the Nintendo PlayStation system was going to be a multi-million dollar item. Guys, I assure you, video games aren't going anywhere. That market will eventually become established. But I'm just saying, even when that market becomes established, if you start comparing it to truly historic markets, you're going to understand why so many millionaires and billionaires diversify into antiques, rare coins, artwork, antiquities, and other markets that the average person doesn't know enough about. So I hope this content really moves you in some way. I hope you are learning something from this channel. Again, the link to this video will be in the description below. Please take the time to watch it. Again, I'm not sponsored by Economics Explained, that YouTube channel, or anything of the like. I just thought it was a very good video. Thank you for watching. Have a great day. Enjoy the rest of your month. Um, I'm still in quarantine sitting here in June in Pennsylvania. So I hope that you're all safe. I'll see you soon. Another video will follow within the next few days. Thanks, guys.